Hi, and welcome to what is hopefully the first of many tutorials on Hugin. It is a panorama photo stitching program that I've been using for about six years, but only recently have I really sort of dove into some of the more advanced features of it. So essentially, Hugin, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly there, Hugin allows you to take a series of photographs, generally from the same point, so you're standing in one spot, and stitch them together into a larger panorama or mosaic. It actually does some other really cool stuff too. But before we get into the advanced features, I thought it would be nice to try doing a video that's essentially an overview of the generic use of Hugin and basically the way I've been using it all of these years until very recently when I started to explore some of the more uh, advanced features which is uh, to, to stitch a few photos together. So I have a few photos that I took. These are of uh, these are taken in East Village, San Diego and it is simply three images taken with my 20 millimeter f17 lens and it's of this street corner so the first image contains most of the left the second image contains the center you can see there's some overlap between these two buildings and the third image contains the right side again there's a bit of overlap so once you've got Hugin installed it's available for Mac OS 10 Windows and Linux. So no matter what computing system you're using, you should be able to find a version that works for you. You just need to load the images. So what we'll do is either hit the load images button or drag the images in. I've gotten that to work on Windows, but it didn't work on my Mac. So it it's it might be operating system dependent. And you can just drag and select all the images. And now you open the images. Now Sometimes it actually opens a pop-up window that asks you what the focal length is, what the focal length multiplier is, what the field of view of the lens is. And it opens up this pop-up window, in my experience, when there's no EXIF data in the photograph about what lens was used. But since this was taken using a digital camera and a digital lens, you can see here that we have the ISO, the exposure bias, exposure time, the aperture, all of these different aspects of the image that we can look at. And it has picked up that it is a 20 slash 40 millimeter lens, if you consider the 35 millimeter equivalent, with a 2x crop factor. So as far as it's concerned, it has a pretty good idea of what our images are made up of. Now, there are quite a few tabs here in Hugin, and one of the things about this program that can be overwhelming is just how much data is in front of you. At certain times, it can feel like you're looking at a spreadsheet or there are just too many buttons to figure out which one you should click. This is probably a good time to flip back to the Hugin website and mention that I recently read through a lot of these tutorials. I know that some people prefer watching videos to reading, and even in some of these tutorials, it can be tricky to sort of get a grasp of how to move around the program. So I'm hoping that this video helps with that. I'd also like to mention that I've recently learned a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about and I learned it from these tutorials. So if you're interested in any of these things, please visit the Hugin website and check it out. Back to this. There's a lot of tabs and, you know, options. And for the most part, you don't really need to use a lot of these for basic functionality. If I were to go back to the Assistant tab and simply click a line, a window pops up and the program sort of springs to life and starts analyzing the photos. Now Hugin is really a tool chain of a few command line utilities combined with of course a lot of good user interface. So what it's doing right now is it's running the images through some of these command line tools, most notably Pano tools and um, a few different executables that it's looking for photometric optimization, it's looking for overlap, and before I could finish explaining what it's doing, it's done. And here you can see, so this slider over here on the right adjusts the vertical field of view, 
I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. And this one here adjusts the horizontal field of view, but it's already set all of these up for us. So I can just undo a couple times, and we can see that it has pretty much successfully stitched these images together. Now when shooting images like this, it's pretty important to try not to move the camera very much. If you're doing a larger image, like a spherical 360 degree panorama, you're probably going to want to use a tripod. And if you want to eliminate all of the parallax errors, you're going to want to use a panel head. And those are some pretty specialized topics that I'm still coming to grips with. But in general, if you're far away from your subject, like I was in this instance, and you try not to move your camera too much, laterally and sort of horizontally and vertically, during the shots, you're going to get pretty good results like this. So here you can hover over the numbers and you can see the images. It's numbered 0, 1, 2. So image 0 is the first one and it's sort of been stretched and skewed. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a future video, I think. And then number one here was stretched and skewed as well. For accuracy, it's, it's not trying to distort the image. And then number two is over here. And so what you'll also notice is that there's a crop rectangle. If I go to the crop tab, I can actually adjust this. Uh, if you hover over one of these light gray rectangles, you can drag that edge of the crop. So I can drag the crop in if I didn't want to see that much of that palm tree or much of this stoplight street sign. And you can sort of crop your image to your liking. And once you're happy with that, you can close the fast panorama preview window. It takes you back to this window and it seems like nothing's changed, but a lot has changed. Over here in the stitcher tab, if you wanted to output your panorama, uh, I usually ask it to calculate the optimal size for the stitch. Now what this is about is uh, if I go back to the preview, I get to that by hitting this GL button, the open GL preview. You can see here this black area and that's sort of our canvas. The, the crop area is within our image size so it's actually going to render the full image and then it's going to crop it. So if I close the preview again, we come back here and we can see that it's sort of calculating the optimal size for this. And then our crop rectangle, I believe it's from the edge, so 4,000 pixels from the bottom edge, 600 pixels from the left edge, etc. And then we can choose a projection and the different types of output. In general, exposure corrected low dynamic range is going to be fine for most instances. You can export as a TIFF or a JPEG. I'll just do a JPEG in this case. So all we have to do is, uh, let me just adjust my window a little bit here. Make sure that we can see it, get it within frame. All we have to do is press the stitch button and it's going to ask us where we want to save the project file. So I'm going to call this one East Village and just press save, it saves the project file, and then it says where do you want to save the image? And so I'd like to save it in the same folder. It's chosen the name, and we get these windows popping up again. It may be off frame in my recording, but there's a little pop-up here in the system tray on Windows. On OS X I believe it opens an additional icon in the dock, but it opens up this batch processor. So you can see jobs that you've worked on before, you can see the current job that's in progress, and in this pop-up window here, you can see the progress of the job. Now it's going through some operations here where it's generating images and it's generating the distorted version of each image, and then it's going to blend them together. Now, for a neatly planned panorama like this one, I shot these images knowing that I was going to do this video. And uh, again, where your subject is quite far away from the camera lens, you don't get many stitching errors. It was pretty early in the morning, so there weren't that many cars around zooming in and out of each image. We should get pretty good results for this stitch. And I've, I've actually done this stitch a couple of times before. So it's running through each image, and now it's doing a in blend. So it's actually blending the seams between the image. Give us a bit of a warning about um, output pixel type. Hopefully that's not a big deal. Again, it's a series of command line tools sort of 
in a chain and sequence to run one off to the other. The output of one is fed into the input of the other. And so it's trying to blend the three images together. You can see image 0, 1, and 2. And as it sort of crunches along, taking a bit longer than it normally does, because I'm recording the screen while I do this, we can see here that it says that it's done. Now if I go back to the project folder, you can see that there's a new image right here, East Village, the name I gave it. It actually retains some of the EXIF data, the date taken, the uh, camera maker. All of the other data is technically lost because it could have been from three images with different shutter speeds, different apertures, it can handle that. And if we were to open this image, we see that the stitch looks pretty good. It's uh, cropped the way we cropped it. The tree is sort of cut out of the edge and we don't see the street sign. I cut out a little bit of the street down here. And this looks really good. If you were to zoom in, it, it it's not really possible to see any of the seams. I'm sure if you looked hard enough, you could find a couple of the seams. Uh, for instance, I think there should be one somewhere around here. I'm having a hard time locating it. Oh, here we go. This this looks like it could be where one of the seams was. Right here where these roof tiles sort of come up. But again, it's it's almost impossible to see. This is a really good stitching job. So that's easy. That's what you do if you just have well-planned imagery and you just put it in one end of the program and it comes out the other. But what do you do if you run into some issues? Well, if we activate Hugin again, Hugin, rather, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that correctly, you can see the different tabs. So we have the images and you can see each image now has your pitch roll and it has a number of control points. It has its order in the stack and in general stuff has been done to these images. If we want to see what was done to the images we can go to the control points tab. Now this is kind of the heart of Hugin or at least the part that I use the most and it shows two images side by side and then it shows control points below. Now it shows the images in these drop down menus image 0, 1, 2 Right now it's showing image 0 in both panes, yet it's showing control points and they're at different locations. The reason for this is a little bit confusing, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. If you select image 0 and image 1, the control points that are shown are normal control points and they reference the same spot. For instance, if I were to choose control point number 3 here, you can see that it's showing the spot down here in the windows where it found a common location and if I press 1 it zooms into it if I press 0 it zooms out and I can click any of the other control points and see them here's control point number 1, number 5, number 4 and you can see these are spots that Hugin has automatically determined have a common ancestry in, in both of the photos now if I zoom back out just by pressing 0 and then I switch to image 0 for both panes it's showing me sort of feature control points. There's a few kinds. There's a vertical line, there's a horizontal line and then there's a line and I believe you can also do a normal control point in this view but I'm not sure why. So what we're seeing here is control point 0 up at the top and then control point 0 further down and that's because it's representing a vertical line. If I press 1 and zoom into control point 0, you can see that it's matching the stack on the building. Now if we open up the OpenGL preview, the window again, um, I just realized that earlier in the video when I showed you the sliders, you may not have seen it because of the... Well, that's interesting, it won't let me select it. going to try to make it large enough. There we go. The interface is being a little bit choppy. It's probably because I'm doing a screen recording. So we look at this interface and we can actually see there's a checkbox that says show control points. And if we show control points, there's a few different kinds we're seeing. Some of them look like X's and those are features. 
I believe they're color coded by how good of a match they are. And then we have these blue lines vertically. And these are vertical line matches. And up here on that part of the building we were looking at, you can see the vertical line. Hugin has actually been able to look at our image and figure out where the vertical lines were. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing, I think. So we have these features right here. And if we choose two different images, we get different features. We get common areas being matched. So if, for instance, you're finding a spot in your image that isn't lining up properly and you're seeing the seam where it's being blended, maybe you need to go in and add more control points. And so that can actually be done really easily. I like to do it with a combination of these options checked. Auto fine tune, auto add, and auto estimate usually work for me. So I want to put a control point at the corner of this gray building between image zero and one. I can just click on image zero and sort of drag it to reposition it right there on the corner of the building. And you can see it actually jumped to image one and it figured out where the corresponding control point is. It's not always going to do that. Sometimes you're going to have to position it in both windows and it's really easy. You just click and drag. So if I were to put one at the top of this building, I can place it there. And you see here that it got it, it got it, um, it hasn't placed it here yet, but I can just click in that general region and it finds it. So now I have control point 20 up at the top of either building. Now once those control points are set, you're going to need to run the optimizer again. This is the next step that Hugin takes. So the optimizer optimizes the positions or the view or the barrel distortion or even other parameters. You can get yourself into some trouble with this optimization step. So they ask you to confirm before the optimization is done. I'll just leave it on the default for positions and say optimize now because I've added a couple more control points. So if I say optimize now, it runs through and it iterates through a couple different strategies and it basically says, here are my results. Would you like to apply the changes or not? So we can get into those, this dialog box in a, in a future video. But then you have exposure and this is where it sort of does photometric compensation between the images. I think you can see it in the GL preview, but we won't see much for these images because I shot them in manual mode at the same exposure. Sometimes if your images have different exposures, this feature can really turn sort of an amateur looking stitch into a professional looking stitch just by making sure they're all at the exact same exposure. So that's a little tour of uh, Hugin and just how to do a basic stitch. It's, it's just three images side by side. The lens data was already there. And all we had to do really was hit the align button and then we could have just clicked create panorama. Um, but instead we went to the stitcher tab and we made sure the canvas was the optimal size. We changed it to JPEG. Then we stitched the panorama. There's a lot of different ways to use the software and the assistant on the first page is one way and you can dive into each tab and fine tune whatever else you're trying to do. So I have a couple ideas for some other videos I'd like to do. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this first video and hopefully I'll have more to come. So until next time, see ya.